All right, guys. Uh, I kind of got cut off a little bit there at the end, so I added some more details in because I was trying to rush and kind of get it in, but I think it's more important to just kind of take it step by step and make sure we get all the details here. So let's just kind of reiterate some of the things that the points I made at the end of the last screencast. The Omaha platform is the platform of the Populist Party going into the election of 1892. It's really their first big national election. So number one, the first thing that they want is they want um, antitrust laws, they want regulation of monopolies and trusts who are really hurting them, specifically in the form of the, of the railroads. Um, the second thing they want is they want the bimetallic standard for the currency. So they want silver and gold backing up our money supply. And so they want this is going to cause inflation, which they want, because they feel like it's going to kind of help them as debtors to pay off their debts easier. Third thing that they want is they want uh, the government to be loaning them money. No longer lo getting money, loans from the banks who are charging them high interest rates and really kind of keeping them in a cycle of debt. They want the government to provide these lower loans, uh, lower interest rate loans that are going to kind of help them and make their farms more affordable. So the, that, those are three things that we talked about. I, we also talked about the tariff, but that's kind of a minor thing. So the other big issues for them, uh, some new things that they kind of introduced. Now these are really important things. Um, as far as number four and number six here, uh, because they introduce these things, it doesn't come take effect as a result of the populist party at this time. But later on, other political parties are going to adopt these ideas, and they do eventually become a part of American society. So this, the graduated income tax is a good example of this. So it's first introduced by the populists um, back in the 1890s, and a graduated income tax means that you pay more taxes based off of how much money you make. So you fall into different tax brackets. Um, so maybe like 20000 to 30000 you might pay a certain rate on your tax. So maybe it's 15% of your income you pay the taxes. Um, let's say 30000 to 40000 though, um, the rate goes up. So you might pay 25% uh, instead of 15%. And so for every tax bracket, you pay more. So the more money you earn, the higher percentage of your income you pay the taxes. And they're going to say that this is fair because you know, you're making more money. You, you should pay a higher percentage of your money to taxes to the government. And so it's kind of, to them, it's a fair situation. It's a, full, it's a fair part of the platform. Number five, government ownership of the, the railroads. Not only the railroads, but other infrastructure, like the telegraph, is something that's key to them because the railroad, they really see this middleman as the one who's truly taking advantage of them the most. And allowing them or not allowing them to make a profit by selling their goods to the east. And so they want the government to take ownership over it because they look at these as key industries and you can't they, they think that you can't have a private business owning these key industries because you know they can manipulate the price and it's something that they need. It's not a luxury item. It's a necessity of these these farmers to ship their goods east. So they think feel like they need the government to take control of this, complete control and regulate it. And the last thing, popular election of senators is another important one because although it doesn't get put in place under the populace, later on, again, other political parties are going to adopt this, and we do have popular election of the senators today. So at this time, state legislators still appointed senators, U.S. senators. You didn't elect them. There wasn't a big election in the state um, for you to, to elect a senator. Only House of Representative members were elected popularly by the people. And so they also pushed for this, to kind of have popular elections of senators. They want they look at these as more democratic reforms. Their opponents, on the other hand, are going to look at these reforms as socialist, as communist, as anarchist. And you can see kind of why they might say that. You know, there's government ownership of, of key industries. Uh, they want, you know, the wealthy to pay more money to taxes. And so a critic of this, a Republican at the time, or a business owner at the time, is going to say, this is socialist, what you're trying to do here. You're trying to redistribute wealth. You're trying to you know, have the government play a bigger role than it's supposed to play. You know, the government shouldn't be loaning you money. And that's kind of the counter-argument here to the populace. And so it's going to kind of bring out a very heated debate um, in the 1890s between the populace, the Democrats, and the Republicans here. Now, in 1892, this is their first jump onto the, the national scene here. So this political cartoon, I think, kind of gives you a good idea of what their opponents, again, are saying of them. They're telling, but basically what they're saying here is that they're just a patchwork of all of these different ideas of the 1870s and 1880s, and they're trying to like fit it all together and make these alliances to make it work. And so they're, the, they're you know, the old farmers alliance, the Grange party, the Greenback party, the Prohibition party, 
they're all kind of just like mixing together and mix matching interests and they're trying to kind of portray them as like just this group that is almost like the lunacy that they're not going to work they have no chance at working and ever getting somebody elected which is not true the populace in the in the election of 1892 do pretty well they don't win but they win over a million votes they win several western states and then, remember they're a third party there's democrats and republicans so when was the last time a third party in you know, the modern era actually won states and actually did some damage. It doesn't really happen, and they made some noise. They made some damage. They did some damage, and they won a lot of states during the election of 1892. So although they lose the election, they kind of look at it as like the stepping stone, and they're going to really put a ton of energy into the election of 1896 and really try and get their guy elected here because they see this as an opportunity to make some headway in the government, to get their platform actually put into place here. So this political cartoon is, is a good political cartoon also, because what you see here, the populist party is kind of eating the Democratic Party here. What starts to happen before the election of 1896, the populist party and the Democratic Party almost kind of merge together. And what you're going to see here, the populist party candidate is also the Democratic Party candidate. They're running, they are together. Basically, the parties are both backing the same guy. So the guy that they're backing is William Jennings Bryan. And they back him for the presidency, so both the Populist Party backs him and the Democratic Party backs him. Because I guess they realize, the Democratic Party realizes, and so does the Populist Party, that they're hurting each other by competing against each other. It would be better to kind of merge together and then try and compete against the Republican Party. And that's what you see happen in the election of 1896 behind the candidacy of William Jennings Bryan. Now, William Jennings Bryan here in this political cartoon, this is a famous one, with him kind of carrying the cross of gold, and it's supposed to kind of be an allusion to the fact that he wants the bimetallic currency, that he wants to back silver and gold with the money, and he's going to be the kind of almost like the crusader for the people, the crusader for the populist party and for the people's party here. And so William Jennings Bryan is, is going to be the key uh, candidate here. He is the candidate. And what he's going to do is he's going to go out and he's going to popularly try and campaign. He's one of the first candidates that goes out all over the country. And he's going to make hundreds and thousands of speeches and try and reach millions of people directly because he really wants to talk to the people to get them to elect him to be the president. Now, in contrast, William McKinley, he's going to do what's called, he, he stays in his house in Ohio and he does front porch campaign. Basically, people come to him. He just sits back, he relaxes, uh, and his, his people kind of invite people to come, come to his front porch, and he speaks from his front porch, but he does not go out and kind of go out there and campaign. He kind of calls Brian like a circus act, that he's going out there and he's campaigning and he's doing these things, and McKinley's kind of more the old-fashioned politician. He's going to let them come to him in his house. Now, some interesting things about uh, William McKinley. His critics, what the populace are going to kind of criticize, just like... Uh, the Democrats, uh, well, just like the Republicans are going to criticize the Populist Party as being this patchwork and these different, these different uh, third party groups, the Democrats and the Populists are going to criticize the Republicans with McKinley and saying that he's really just the puppet master of these people, these industrialists behind the scenes. And the big one that they point to is this guy named Mark Hanna, who really kind of funds McKinley's campaign. He's a big Ohio industrialist, and so he kind of gets this nickname like the puppet master. And I believe your, your textbook just kind of like waves it off like it's not true. Um, but in some ways, it is true. He is fin financing a lot of the campaign. And so McKinley is getting money from big business. I mean, Rockefeller himself is going to just throw millions of dollars at this campaign, hundreds of thousands of dollars and millions of dollars at the campaign to try and get McKinley elected. And so you definitely kind of see some elements of things that you see in the modern elections of people and industrialists and big business getting involved in the elections here. So what actually happens in the election of 1896? The Populist Party slash Democratic Party candidate, William Jennings Bryant, loses. Um, but what you notice here is that he wins the entire South and he wins the entire West, basically, that Midwestern section. Um, so he does really well. This is a close election, but McKinley is able to kind of pull out the election. And really what McKinley's strength is here is that uh, the people listen to him because he feels they feel like uh, he's going to be able to solve the economic crisis here. There's a major, what they call a panic at the time, but we would call a depression going on in the United States. And so McKinley, I feel like, ha as the, with the business interest, has a better plan and a more sound plan to kind of fix the economy. And it really hinges on this silver-gold debate 
again. And so what this is all about is that I feel like if McKinley really pushes this point that if you allow for silver to kind of back up our money, it's going to cause this inflation and it's going to really hurt American currency and hurt our economy even more and kind of plunge us deeper into a depression. And so that's kind of how he's able to sell it to the American people and to get elected. So this is a key election and a very interesting election and something that we're going to talk about in a lot more detail uh, tomorrow. So hopefully you took some good notes today and you come in prepared tomorrow, um, ready to analyze this material in kind of a unique way. All right, so I'll see you guys tomorrow in class.